Thanks, everybody, for joining us today on our daily uh, action call for today. I'm Brent Christensen with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, thanks again for joining us. You can always follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at GSO Chamber for the latest information. Um, we also send out a daily email to our members, recording of this call, any relevant links, and that sort of thing. So uh, be on the lookout for that. If you're not a member and you're on this call, all the links to those resources and recordings can be found on our website at greensboro.org backslash COVID-19. One big plug here, um, North Carolina is, uh, is near the bottom in terms of ranking for participation rates or response rate for the census. And so we'd appeal to you all while you're at home, many of you are at home, uh, to fill out your census forms. An accurate count means extra funding for our community. It means we're going to get the funding we do need and deserve, as well as representation in Washington, D.C., uh, and many other things. That, that census is the basis for a number of federal programs, and, and we need you all to fill that out. We need that participation rate to go up. We need to be um, not 41st, but first in that. So please do um, fill out your census form as, as soon as you possibly can. I will also remind everybody, I've got the Zoom group chat uh, window up on my browser. I hope you do as well. As we go through this, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to pop those in right there and we'll make sure that Will gets around to answering them. Uh, Will, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Will Quick is a certified information privacy professional, CIPP, and a board certified specialist in privacy and information security law by the North Carolina State Bar Board of Legal Specialization. Will has spoken and written on a variety of data privacy and cybersecurity issues, including emerging state regulations, complications and advantages of new technologies like the burgeoning Internet of Things industry, and trends in privacy litigation. Will assist businesses with designing and implementing privacy policies that are compliant with the ever-growing set of regulations. He also helps companies that experience data breach events with the response and notification process, often coordinating efforts across multiple states. Will has held multiple leadership positions within the North Carolina Bar Association, currently serving as treasurer of the Privacy and Data Security Section Council and as secretary of the Young Lawyers Division. Will is also on the board of directors for the North Carolina State University Alumni Association and the advisory board for the North Carolina Pro Bono Resource Center. Please help me welcome Will Quick with uh, the Brooks Pierce Law Firm. Will, give us a quick hello so that we know you're on and that your microphone's working. I'm here and uh, good to, to hear you, Brent, and I hope everyone else can hear me. We, I, I can, and I believe everybody else can as well. So uh, again, great to have you on today. Yesterday, I know you were on our call yesterday, which was great. So yesterday, you got to hear us talk about um, the new intricacies of of managing people and, and, and building culture and that sort of thing around uh, some of us that have been thrown into this uh, telework thing, this working remotely thing um, that continues to grow uh, with, the, with the spread of COVID-19. Um, we wanted to bring you on because we know that when you do that, you, uh, you open up your business to some new uh, threats, unfortunately. And um, so talk to us right off the bat here. Well, what, what are the top two or three things that businesses ought to be thinking about as we go to work remotely as it, as it concerns um, our, our data security and IT and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, well, again, thank you all for having me and uh, uh, look forward to whatever questions folks may have as we go on. Um, as you, you know, might imagine, uh, people in my world are working with clients of all shapes and sort of sizes to try and figure out how to make this remote, you know, working, work from home, telework thing uh, work for them. And it is different uh, for everybody, but there are a few things um, that no matter, you know, the size of your business and, and how familiar you may be already with working from home, um, you know, that you ought to remind employees um, and or do yourself, um, as you move forward. And so, I, you know, the, maybe the three most important things it, it, to my mind are, are honestly relatively simple. Um, I would say one of the most important things um, to remind employees 
is is to update and patch their home networks. Um, there are is amazing, you know, how long sometimes folks will go without making any changes um, to their home networks. And given the proliferation of you know everyone working from home, bad actors um, know that that is a is a a vulnerability that it always exists, but the ability to take advantage of it is, is usually relatively low um, because it's hard to figure out when someone is, for example, working from home and, and, and remoting into their workspace. Right now, the bad actors know everybody is doing it. Um, so a very simple thing that everyone can do is to remind employees um, who are working from home to update and patch uh, you know, their home networks. And that, that kind of thing can usually be done fairly easily by um, going to the, you know, whoever your service provider's uh, website is to make sure that whatever updates are available, you know, your employees have installed. Um, you know, I think maybe the, the second thing, this is more from the business side, um, is, is to ensure that the systems you're using uh, to allow employees to remote in are updated and patched as well. Uh, and that you're using um, the, you know, the most robust system that you can manage under the circumstances. Um, I'll give you an example of you know, what, what that might look like. When you're remoting in, you have different options for technologies. Uh, there's virtual private networks. That's probably you know, one of the highest, best ones right now available. Many of you may be familiar with the old Microsoft um, remote network protocols um, to get into your network that way. That's not as good and not as secure. Um, but again, if it's your only option, then make it as secure as you can. Uh, you know, and then I think the third thing, um, maybe maybe to, to remind companies and that we continue to remind companies is document every decision you are making um, about why you're doing things and what you've got to do. Uh, as Brent mentioned, one of the things I do is help clients respond to data incidents that happen on the back end um, and I haven't done this yet but I, I'm, I, I keep thinking I'm going to sit down one of these days and, and just draft up what I think the data incident response letter is going to look like um, eight months from now when I know that someone is going to call me and say hey we had a data breach and it's related to COVID-19 and we did all we could to make our systems you know as secure as we could but we also had to keep our business going that will inevitably happen um, and the first thing I'm going to ask you know the client that calls me in that situation is you know tell me about everything you did and why you did it so that we can understand it and explain it to the regulators um, so those would be the, maybe the three most important things I would say off the bat so talk to us about and, and that that's a great one in, in terms of data breaches where where do you see the most common weaknesses in terms of data breaches, um, and, I, and I know you deal from very big businesses to very small businesses. You probably have a number of folks on this call who are small business owners who they may be the IT department. Um, they may be able to outsource a little bit of IT to some folks who can help. Where, where are those weaknesses, those weak points? You already, I think, mentioned one of them in terms of making sure that you know, software is updated and that sort of thing. But where would you see the, the weakness points uh, in our networks for small businesses? Yeah, I, so, you know, I, I follow a number of, um, you know, industry blogs and, and the FBI and the Homeland Security um, put out great, you know, updates on what, on trends they are seeing. Um, and they do that very, very regularly. Uh, the warning that I have seen the most frequently, and I think, you know, I, it, I think it will bear out, um, it is a warning from the FBI's cyber division and Homeland Security that they are seeing significant upticks in, and, and this is, I mean, this is sad, but it's, but it's the truth, it's the world we live in, and COVID-19 related um, phishing and water holing scams. Um, if you're not familiar with the, with the idea of phishing, I suspect most are, but, but very briefly, it's, you know, where someone is impersonating, um, uh, someone else to try and get information to, to gain access to your system. So you might get the email that looks like it came from someone in your company's accounting department saying, send me all your W-2s because it's tax season. It is tax season. Um, and we see those normally. Um, but, 
instead of it being the person who actually should be getting that, it's someone impersonating that person. Um, or, you know, a more broad one is you see some email that has a link to some information about the spread of COVID-19. You know, learn about how it's spreading in North Carolina. Click here. And when you click there, it immediately installs some sort of malware um, or ransomware on your device um, that if you're, net, if you're remoted into the network and your network you know, has vulnerabilities, could cause major shutdowns. Um, and so we're seeing those types of incident, incidents specifically related to COVID-19 um, and, and where they have occurred the most so far are in the three states that have the highest um, numbers of, of cases, Washington, New York, and California, but they are happening everywhere. And I suspect as cases go up in states, you know, bad actors will start targeting states that have a lot of cases to try and get someone who's not paying attention um, to let them into their system and then wreak whatever havoc they will. So now that we have a number of folks that are, that are working remotely and dialing in uh, remotely, I should say, I, when I say dial in, I'm, I'm giving away my age a little bit um, uh, there because we all remember, some of us remember those, those dial in days. Um, I know that you're able to give your network different levels of access. Um, can you talk about some of the things we should be reviewing as we, as we do that? Because uh, sometimes I think you could have some folks that are navigating their way through portions of the network that perhaps they, they shouldn't be, right? Yes, so that, this is a, a, an important you know, point. Um, most of us are used to you know, maybe some level of your workforce working remotely. Maybe you, you know, have a company that has a sales staff that works remotely almost every day. Um, and, and there's a need for those salespeople to have you know, access to certain systems on your network. But then when you have to send home your accounting staff or your, um, uh, you know, everyone else, your, your, your CEOs, your executive people who are normally working from a, you know, go into an office, generally a nine to five type, type job, not the executives, I realize you all have jobs that are not nine to five like mine, um, but you've got, you know, different parts of your company, your human resources department, who usually is on site when you're having to send those people home, but they also have to continue doing their jobs. Um, you have to start thinking through ways to gain access to the systems on your network that they need, um, that maybe the sales staff that was used to working remotely and can continue to do whatever they do remotely to some extent, at least, I guess they can't travel. Um, but you don't want the sales staff or someone else to have access to HR's information about all personnel. You don't want someone in department Y to have access to information in department X. Um, what we are seeing is a lot of companies are just giving remote access to everything to everyone um, because that's the easy and quick decision and we just need to get everybody out of the office and home because there's a stay at home order coming down at five o'clock today. Um, I, and, and, you know, that is understandable from the perspective of you've got to keep working. Um, but if you have the time, please think through, uh, you know, who needs access to what and how to appropriately block that access, even when you're remoting into your network. I appreciate that. And, 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 and I've, I've been reading some of your uh, pieces and, and there's one that you just recently put up on the Brooks Pierce website. And so we'll make sure that we link to that. We'll, um, when, when we're done with this call to make sure that, that everybody's got, I think there are a lot of great points in there, but, but you've got something in here that, that I had never heard of. Um, uh, BYOD. Um, I've heard of BYOB, but I'm not sure I'd ever heard of BYOD. Talk about, BYOD policies and why it's important to have one or to review one right now. Yeah, so, so that is um, bring your own device policies. And, you know, we, we work with clients pretty regularly to put those in place under normal circumstances. Um, it, it's become, you know, pretty much the norm. And actually, I think someone on the call uh, yesterday, you know, referenced that we're used to now hooking up your own 
you know, your iPhone, for example, to your company system to get email. Um, or we're used to using our tablets, uh, you know, for work purposes. Um, many companies that, you know, only have desktops available for their employees are now going to see that it's just not practical for everyone to call their desktop computers home. So, okay, we're going to allow, you know, the employees to use their home laptops or home computers um, if they have them and connect them to the network through a VPN or, or other remote access technology. Um, and maybe there are not, you know, maybe there are, maybe that's something that you thought through in your, in your device policy, but most likely not. Um, and so I think it's important, you know, to revise and update those uh, BYOD, bring your own device policies, or put one in place, um, or at least put guidelines in place, you know, as to what your employees can do or should be doing um, when they're using their devices uh, for, for work purposes. You know, some of that goes back to the points I was making earlier about as simple as just ensuring that, that your home devices and home networks are updated and patched. Um, I, I think of my parents um, who were, you know, who were both very recently retired, but until they retired about um, two or three years ago, you know, I was pretty much their home IT person uh, whenever they had a problem and I would go and, and you know, log into my, my mom and dad's computer at home and, you know, it wouldn't have been updated in five years, three years, whatever, you know, whatever system or whatever they were using. Um, so those sort of things should be addressed in device policies. Uh, you know, you should also have in those policies um, provisions for, uh, you know, wiping devices or or at least um, accessing devices if they've been stolen or lost um, most of us are not going to be out and about right now and so the the chances of losing a device are pretty low um, but in the event that someone does um, you know you, you want to be able to deal with that situation um, there are also you know lots of great applications and technologies out there to help secure personal devices um, that can be put into place and I'm not a, you know, expert in what the, the best technology is, um, but there are a lot of them out there that, you know, are better than not having anything at all to help um, secure personal devices that might become uh, connected to your network. So for those of us who have not heard of BYOD policy and, and perhaps have never seen one, are there some BYOD uh, uh, examples out there that you would point us to, Will, uh, that we might be able to to take a look at to maybe provide for our own? Well, uh, certainly I'm happy to answer any questions yeah. uh, offline for folks who, who might want to follow up and, and put this kind of thing in place. Um, you know, as far as, uh, as far as things that are available publicly, um, I don't know this, but I suspect um, I'm not 100% not about this, but I suspect that the the IAPP, which is the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the group that I'm cert certified under, um, I would suspect that their website probably has some pretty good guidance mm -hmm. um, on these sorts of things. Um, and so, if you're, you know, if you're if if you're Googling um, to look for something like this, um, you know, maybe going to the IAPP website um, and searching their website might be a good a good starter um, I'm not endorsing any specific <laughs> uh, right. policy from a legal perspective but um, you know there are certainly uh, probably you know that that might be a better resource um, and again happy to talk with anybody who might have follow-up questions about you know this sort of policy or uh, I don't know if you'll get to this Brent but you know incident response plans um, are I think important part of any business uh, you know, what you have available. Um, and so what I mean by incident response plan is if you do have a breach event um, that, you know, you have a plan in place to know how to respond to that, who should be the contacts, who should be dealing with different parts of the response. Um, you know, those sorts of plans are becoming almost the norm now mm -hmm. um, in, in being a good steward of personal information and when you are trying to respond. And so, um, you know, these are all things that companies may not have thought of as much um, while they were working, you know, while, while everything was going well and everyone was working in the office. But now that you're learning to 
to work remotely. Um, some of these things, you know, ought to be in place. I don't want you to have to go through all the gory details, but, and I do want you to change the names to protect the innocent, but, but tell us a few data breach stories that, that might give us some good um, lessons uh, that we could learn from other folks um, mistakes. Do you have a, a couple that you might have in mind just to kind of walk us through some of those? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the one, um, the one that pops to mind the most um, and that I, that I have dealt with um, a number of times outside of COVID-19, um, but I know that I suspect this is happening quite a bit right now, um, is a scenario where you're a small business, um, you know, you've got maybe five, 10 employees, as you noted earlier, Brent, you're, you are your own IT staff. Someone, someone is the IT staff. Um, and you've got people working from home and you rely on third parties, uh, to, to provide a lot of your, you know, technology resources. And you're used to getting calls from, Microsoft, for example, who you might use Office 365, um, you know, you're used to getting a call from a tech support person at Microsoft um, when there's a problem. Well, the bad actors know that. They know a lot of people use something like Office 365. And so they will, they will impersonate and just call random numbers with no indication of whether or not, um, you know, the, the num phone number they are calling is someone who actually is using their using Office 365 until they find somebody that picks up the phone and says, oh, yeah, I'm using Office 365. And they'll say something like, you know, yes, we've noticed that there's a problem with your system or your network's going slow. Odds are a lot of our networks are going slow right now because there's so many people loading the network um, from remote working or working from home. And they'll say something like, if you'll, if you'll just go to you know, website XYZ, Type this in, and I can run a quick test on whether or not your network's working appropriately. Uh, person does that, and then as soon as they've done that and they clicked on the, the link in, to run, quote unquote, run the test, there's malware installed on their computer, and they are locked out, um, or their network, if they're all the way, you know, if they're logged in to their company's network, and someone, you know, is either uh, stealing the data without telling you, or they've shut down your, your network and are now giving you a ransom request. We see that quite regularly under normal circumstances. Everyone is on high alert. Everyone is stressed right now with, you mm -hmm. know, with this new normal we're dealing with. Um, I have no doubt that that scenario will occur. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's bound to happen. Um, you know, another one that we see, uh, you know, a fair bit um, are, are the phishing incidents that I, that I mentioned earlier, just the, the straight up email. Um, it is tax season and, uh, you know, I'm dealing already again, unrelated to COVID-19, but uh, I, again, I suspect that this will increase um, as more people are working, you know, from home. The, the person impersonating Brent, who is the head of the chamber, uh, to email whoever handles accounting and or, or um, oh, yeah. tax matters yep. for the chamber, say, you know, from an email address that's Brent Christensen, but with a O instead of an E, and and impersonating you and asking for all the W twos to be sent to them, uh, and then all that information is available from social security numbers to you know, home addresses. Um, and because nobody's working down the hall from anybody else right now to say, hey, did you mean to send me that, Brent? <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Right. And how can you how can you tell it's fishing? What, what, what's a dead giveaway that it's that it's fishing? Well, uh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of these come from what we call, you know, nation state actors, um, foreign foreign nation state actors or, or bad actors that are, you know, for not uh, not in the U.S. So. Uh, Look for the language, um, you know, if, if they're using language that is not normal um, in, in sort of American speak, um, then, you know, that's, that can be a giveaway. Um, it's always a good idea, and I, you know, I, I'm just in the habit, but it's good for all of us to make it the habit. Just go hover over the email address right. uh, in the email and double check to make sure that it looks like what it should look like. Um, you know, is the name spelled correctly? 
uh, is the is it the right you know at URL at the end there um, so simple things like that you know another step that businesses can put in place um, and it's really easy if you're using for example uh, you know a Microsoft Exchange server for your email but I, I, I know others have this you know I believe even Gmail has this available um, you can set up a, an external banner um, to to show up on incoming emails every time an email is coming from somewhere external to your network really um, yeah it's a really easy thing to do um, again if you have a Microsoft Exchange server I know it's it's readily you know it's, it's, it's there and you don't have to do anything extra except for set it up and you can you can Google external banner you know email external banner Microsoft and Microsoft has a, a step-by-step -step to walk you through how to set that up um, but that's pretty helpful in blocking a lot of those phishing scams coming from external sources because uh, if it does if it's coming from Brent Christensen and it doesn't say you know it says external then something's something's not matching up here right right it happens to the best of us Will. I can tell you uh, I got a picture one morning from somebody in my office who shall remain nameless showing me the uh, Apple gift cards that had been purchased right. at my uh, request um, right thankfully that picture had not been sent to um, the Fisher or the Fisher man or Fisher woman but um, <laughs> I immediately texted back and said I don't know what you're talking about so um, it, it, it yeah. happens to the best of us that's for sure and you know you you bring up uh, I think you know, two thoughts come to mind with that comment, Brent. That um, we are all working remote. It is a new normal. It's it's going to be our reality for some indefinite period of time. Um, but gosh, if you're you know if you're in charge of your company, and I know a lot of folks on this this call are, um, make make it clear to everyone that you work with that that it's okay to pick up the phone and double check something. Um, yeah. You know don't change this sort of goes to just don't change the habits that would make you a safe workplace were you down the hall from somebody just because you're working from home um if you were if you would normally get up and walk down the hall to double check something or ask a question pick up the phone and and call the person um because you know their number hey did that did you mean to send me this or was this do you really need me to send you that um think about you know Think through that sort of new normal as well. Um, we all feel a little isolated right now, and I'm, you know, I, I'm like everybody else. My firm is all working remote, and um, I'm, I'm guilty of it. You know, just typing out an email when I could probably make a quick phone call. Right. Um, so think through that. Uh, and then you know, the, the second thing um, is related to that. <laughs> uh, we all have you know either you have an IT department or you are the IT department or someone at your your you know is designated that in addition to a hundred other um, job duties um, realize that they are probably even more stressed than than the rest of us right now because they're they're dealing with trying to make this work um, and you know be uh, be cognizant of that be you know be empathetic to what they're dealing with um, and try to work with them. But the even I'm, you know, even I'm guilty of this, of sending an email to IT saying, Hey, something's going slow on the network. <laughs> um, right. Fix it. Right. Let them focus on these other issues, you know, that are broader than my emails running slow. <laughs> well, and your, and your thoughts on, you know, picking up the phone and verifying something with somebody is uh, a human version of two, two factor authentication, right? That is right. Yeah, I mean that's um, I, I, for your VPNs and your and your other ways you log in. Two-factor authentication is great, but that's a great you know other way of doing that. Um, you know, for things that are just just normal course of business. Right. Right. Just make sure because there are some some unique threats that we're not used to out there. I mean, you blew me away when you said you click on the see how COVID nineteen is spreading in North Carolina or the United States because you know, a lot of us are, you know, especially right now are real curious about that. Um, how do you, how do you, yeah. Tell, how can you tell that that's a real link and, and not, and not uh, malware? Can you hover over okay, it? So, yeah. Click on it as well. 
So, well, well, so for everybody listening, what Brent's sort of re- referencing is, is he and I had a, a quick call yesterday, um, and I and I'd mentioned that uh, one of the scams that you know, the FBI had 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 already noticed and had actually referenced in their most recent alert was um, was a number of, of false websites that were set up uh, to show. You, we've probably all seen them on our local news, you know, highlighting where the the, the diseases. Uh, or the virus is spreading and where the most cases are and different shadings to show the, the, the most, um, you know, virulent areas. Uh, and, and there are a number of false websites set up uh, to do that, um, except that when you click on, you know, for example, Guilford County to see what the number in Guilford County is, again, it's installing some sort of malware or ransomware in the background. Um, you know, as far as how to not do that, um, I know it's it's uh, it is common nature just to Google things. Um, hey, what's the spread of COVID-19? And you click on the first link that's available. But try to be extra cognizant right now. Um, you know that that this stuff is out there, and so look to get your news from known and trusted sources. Mm. Um, you know, go to your local news channel's website or go to a. You know, I don't know no. no preferences on who you use to get your national news, Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, you know, go to one of these large um, known media outlets to get information like that, uh, because at least you know, you know, that that those are legitimate sources. Um, Don't just click on every link that somebody sends you or that you, you know, you may come across scrolling Facebook or Instagram or something like that. it's tough not to do it, but it, it, right. you know, it's important to get in that habit. That's right. That's right. Great. Well, uh, well, I'm looking for questions. It looks like I, I know a lot of people have some questions and I will, I will get to that about uh, an impending stay at home order that we've got uh, that we're looking at here in Greensboro and in Guilford County, but I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of questions for you, which is, um, which is, good and bad. I mean, good because, you know, it sounds to me like, uh, like, like you did a great job in, in really explaining this. Um, it's also maybe good that I think a lot of people are getting it and understand it and are, you know, you know maybe people are too scared to ask that um, this whole new, this brave new world that we've entered is uh, a little bit overwhelming, but um, I think you've done a great job and I really appreciate uh, you being willing to join us. I appreciate Brooks Pierce being willing to share one of their resources with us. Um, we really do appreciate that very much. And um, yeah, we're at 3:35, So um, I don't see a whole lot of other questions, but let me, let me, and if you're what, you know, Will, you're welcome to, to, to sign off if you like, but uh, again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that very much. Well, Brent, thank you guys for having me. Um, you know, I'll stay on and listen because uh, while I'm actually uh, I'm actually in our Raleigh office, you know, uh, we are a business in Guilford County as well, and um, I have seen a number of emails flying around today about the uh, the potential stay-at-home order to be announced at four o'clock uh, there in Guilford, and um, you know, again, I'll 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 plug our firm one more one more time um, uh, shamelessly, but w- you know, we are working yep. with a lot of companies um, to help determine, uh, you know, whether or not when these stay-at-home orders go in place, you know, you fall into essential services um, or should be considered, um, you know, to fall into essential services if, you're, if, if you weren't included already. Uh, so we've got folks that are dealing with COVID-19 from a lot of different areas, um, but that's one as well. So that's right. uh, I'll we listen can, to the rest of it for now. Thanks, Brent. I really appreciate that. We can, we can help with that here at the chamber as well. We've heard from a number of businesses kind of anticipating this um, and have been working with a number of them. And, and, and I can tell you the, at least the ones we've heard from, uh, especially in the manufacturing area, um, a lot of them have ties to the medical industry or to a distribution industry. And, 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 and most of those, if not all of those, are going to be uh, exempt from something like this. We've got to keep, especially the medical industry going, uh, the food industry going. I mean, there are a lot of, lot of things that, that have to be taken into consideration. I know that this is, uh, this is all being taken into consideration at all levels of our government, federal, state, and local. Uh, it is my understanding that today at, at 4, um, there will be an announcement of a stay-at-home order. Um, it's my understanding it will be... Uh, 
It will be for uh, Guilford County, including the cities of Greensboro and High Point. I know for sure it will be at least Greensboro, um, and it will it will take play it will it will take effect not immediately. It will take effect I think sometime late Friday, either late Friday afternoon or or Friday evening, um, and so uh, we're going to sign off here in plenty of time. For everybody to tune into that news conference, I would uh, ask all of you all as well. I'm sure that there will be uh, opportunities to read through the entire order, um, and so uh, I think it'll be a lengthy order to read through. Um, so uh, read through that before we jump to any uh, conclusions. But I think it's been very well thought out. Obviously, we have a number of uh, folks in our community, especially the healthcare providers. Who are very concerned about this community, very concerned about uh, what might happen with the spread of COVID-19, um, and they've been they've been quite uh, vocal about that. And and I think that our local officials, our state officials, our federal officials are listening to them as well. They should. And so um, I've got a question um, from somebody: Will the news conference be live or on WFMY? I know that it is. Um, I know that it's taking place at the county courthouse um, so either the county will have it live the city will have it live I would imagine that the news will pick that up and probably cut in as well um, and so uh, I think you can watch that there but again make sure that you're looking at all of the documentation as well and if you have any issues any concerns anything that we need to know about please do contact us at the chamber our, uh, our phone number is 336-387-8300 uh, um, you can you can contact us. We are open for business. We're working remotely, but we're open for business. I will also tell you that one of the things we'll look into for tomorrow is perhaps bringing uh, a local official, uh, city manager, county manager, somebody like that to come on with us, answer any questions you might have, and explain the order in more detail um, to us. So we'll take a look at that. And we're also looking for tomorrow to have um, a small business expert um, with us to explain uh, the more available assistance that is coming online um, with phase three of the uh, of the package that's coming out of Washington, D.C. at the federal level. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, that bill uh, passed into law and then signed into law by the time we talk again tomorrow. Uh, but there will be a lot of details that, that we'll need to know about that. We want to get in your hands very quickly as to how small businesses can avail themselves of that assistance uh, as we go forward through this through this uh, through this time, so we're working on those two things for tomorrow. We'll talk to everybody again tomorrow at three o'clock, and we really really do appreciate you all uh, joining us. Will again, thank you for joining us, and I'm going to sign off. Uh, it's good to hear from everybody, and we'll talk again tomorrow at three. Thanks so much. Bye now. <laughs>